International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Congregation Emmanuel. Um, you know, last night this room was completely full, and we were here for our regular Friday night services, but we also included in our service a memorial for um, those who were killed in Orlando, those who were killed in Charleston a year ago, and those who were recently killed in Tel Aviv. And I share that with you because um, it's so important to us that this congregation, that this building be a place where we can really address everything that we confront in life, including the hard stuff. And we know that there is such a profound relationship between gun violence and racism and the epidemic of violence in our culture right now. And so the opportunity that we have today to continue the conversation around um, how, to, how to really make a difference is so important and thank you so much for being here and for, for helping us make Congregation Emmanuel a place where this conversation takes place. So welcome. I would like to uh, thank very much uh, Rabbi, uh, the Congregation Emmanuel for allowing the San Francisco Black Film Festival to have this very, very important conversation that we all need to hear. My name is Jackie Wright, and I am, have been working with the uh, San Francisco Black Film Festival for the last few years, about three or four years right now. And one of the key elements of that, the Black Film Festival, is to make sure that social justice is something that is brought to the forefront. Uh, the originator of the Black Film Festival, Ave Montague, one of the reasons she started the film festival is because of so many negative images of the African diaspora and the black community that goes over the airwaves and they're never challenged. It's just those images. So you don't get to see um, the counter uh, dialogue of the positive things that happen in, in the black community. And therefore, decisions are, are being made that impact people and on all aspects of their lives. So we appreciate the fact that Jeff Adachi submitted his film, America Needs a Racial Facial. It's eight minutes. It's gonna be followed by a clip of Chief Tony Chaplin, who's the acting chief of the San Francisco Police Department. And we know a lot of the things that have been going on with the police department from um, the egregious shootings to the racist text messaging and that sort of thing. So Chief Chaplin couldn't be here today, but we do have him sharing his experience personally. I'm a commander with the San Francisco Police Department. I've been employed here for 25 years. Um, I took the test for the police department uh, 26 years ago, uh, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, one night, Prior to getting in the police department, I was going through the testing process. I was driving um, my friends to a nightclub, hang out, do our thing. The designated driver program had just started, and yours truly was a designated driver. Um, went to the club, had a great time. Club closed down at a little after 1.30, um, stopped serving drinks, and shut completely down at 2 a.m. As we were leaving the parking lot, we were blocked by another car, and we started to honk at the car. As we honked at the car, the guy blasted his radio, uh, was playing some uh, explicit lyrics, and uh, we kept honking. He finally pulled out of the parking lot after uh, a San Jose officer got behind us and lit our car up uh, with the red and the blue lights. We were stopped, and uh, the officer walked up to my car, asked me to exit the car. I did. He asked me for identification. I threw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground. He asked me for another form of identification, which I provided him, my military ID card. He threw that on the ground. He asked me for uh, more identification, and I told him I left my birth certificate in Oklahoma. He then said, you're a funny guy. And I said, well, I'm not trying to be, but you're throwing my identification on the ground. I'm doing everything right. And he said, oh, are you? So I'm in here in his parking lot trying to make sure you don't get killed, and you're playing uh, F the police. 
and I explained to him that was not coming from my car, that my car was not equipped with a cassette player. And uh, this tells you how long ago it was. There were no DVDs or, 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 uh, or CDs back then. And so he insisted that it came from my car even though it had not. I then uh, told him that my intentions were to not be harassed, I was going to leave. He told me to pick my identification up, I refused. He said, if you leave, you're going to be pulled over and cited. I got in my car anyway, his uh, partner walked up and uh, handed me my identification. I got back out of the car and I said, listen man, for the last time, that didn't come out of my car. I just took the test to get into the Highway Patrol and the San Francisco Police Department. And this is the part that stuck with me for uh, well over a decade and you know, even now I still think about it. Three times he told me, you will never make it. Three times. And the last time he pointed, almost hit me in my chest with his finger. And uh, it's the angriest I've ever been. And I tell you, tears welled up in my eyes and got in my car and I left. The ride back to the barracks was a long one. My friends told me, do not do this job under any circumstances. They had me talked out of applying and doing it. Uh, I got back to the barracks. It was about 3.30 uh, in the morning and I'm standing on a payphone talking to my mother and telling her that you were right, I'm not doing this job. She then quickly corrected me and said she didn't want me to be a police officer because of the dangers associated with it. But if I withdrew my application, she would fly to California and beat the living daylights out of me for letting someone else dictate the outcome of my future. And that's why I continued on that path and got into the police department and 25 years later I'm a commander of police in San Francisco and uh, it's why I advocate for people to come in because there has to be change and that change is only going to come with, uh, with, with people applying from the community. If you see something being done wrong you cannot change it from the outside, you have to do it from the inside. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jock Wilson and uh, also today here with us is Jaku Wilson, my twin brother who's in the back right there. Uh, he was, uh, he, he's also an attorney and he's part of the reason why I'm up here and uh, he works with uh, Mr. Jeff Adachi, he's a public defender and uh, part of the work we do ties into a lot of the work with what Mr. Uh, Adachi does. And uh, uh, the reason why we started Advocates for Justice about 10 years ago is we grew up in Modesto uh, and we know some of the implicit biases uh, that young people of color have to face. And about three years ago, I was contacted by the president of the NAACP, uh, Modesto Stanislaus Branch, and he was uh, concerned because there was an alarming number of students of color who were being suspended and expelled from school. And he, uh, he asked me would I come out and I, would I take a look at it and see what was going on. And, uh, after some, some persuasion, I agreed to go out there. And what I did first is I started off with a public records request. And what a public records request allows is that it allows a person to get information from a governmental entity uh, without filing a lawsuit. And in that, I asked certain questions. And what I, discussed, what I requested was uh, the data for a seven-year period. Uh, I asked for all the suspension data uh, between 2006 and 2013. And what I discovered is what I coined actually an education equity nightmare. During that seven year period, uh, I discovered that uh, between 2006 and 2013, that there were 414 African American males enrolled in the junior high system, and that those young boys were suspended an astonishing 584 times. Basically, each black male had been suspended one and a half times. And so as a result of that, my brother and I, uh, you know, it's easy to talk about the problem. And we're up here talking about the problem today, but I also like to talk about the solutions. And so what we decided to do is we started our program, a mentor program under our Advocates for Justice program. And what we do is we try to give young African-American students and people of color and all students an opportunity to see African-Americans in a positive role. Because uh, part of what the implicit bias deals with is the stereotypes that people hold. And so I think it's important as leaders and of any people of color and just humanity is that we got to start changing the image of the young black males, uh, people of color. And so that when people, when they think of an African American or they think of a, a person who's a drug dealer or a gang person, they don't think of just that being an African American. And when they, they have a positive role model or image to compare that to, that's when we start uh, getting the change that we want to see. And so uh, part of what we do is not only we focus on the pro problem, we represent kids free in suspension and expulsion hearings, but then we bring solutions to the table like restorative justice, like PBIS, like positive role models. So I won't keep going. I'm sorry for, for going along, but uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Mr. Adachi. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's really great to be here. 
and thank you for coming. I know we're competing with a, with a nice day today. Um, I want to thank uh, Jackie and the Black Film Festival for making the screening possible. Uh, first of all, there are 60 films in this festival, so you should definitely come out and, and see. And these kind of festivals, I think, are so important in terms of bridging information gaps that we all have, you know, based on the fact that we know so little about each other, which is really one of the sources of both explicit and implicit bias. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term uh, unconscious bias. How many of you ever have heard that term? It's it's actually become um, you know, part of the nomenclature probably in the past three to five years. There's very little that was known about it. And it's primarily studies in the area of neuroscience that have revealed that we all have both conscious and unconscious biases. You might have a, a conscious bias for a particular type of food or ice cream. Uh, and, and that's a conscious bias. That's something that you are aware of and, and, and something that dictates your decisions and that you might even express. I, I like strawberry ice cream. And then you have unconscious biases, which are those biases which we're not necessarily aware of and that we uh, may not even be aware that our decisions are dictated uh, by uh, leanings that we have uh, that we're not even aware of, consciously aware of. And there's been a tremendous amount of, of testing done in this area. Uh, Harvard created a test called the Implicit Association Test, and you can find it online, and you can take it on your computer. And it, it flashes images of white faces and black faces and words and associations, and you're asked to choose, good or bad. And that test has shown overwhelmingly uh, that people, even people of the same uh, ethnicity, uh, will have biases. And if you think about it this way, if you were walking, you know, to your car late at night and you saw a particular type of person come towards you, and so you would grab your purse, you know, uh, because you're afraid. Or if, if you're holding something, you might hold that tighter. That's an example of a implicit bias. And it's those kinds of, of reactions that have actually been tied to a part of the brain called the amygdala. It's the, the, the fight or flight um, part of your brain. And it reacts. And it's going to send out a danger signal. It's going to send out fear, uh, anxiety. All those things, uh, emotional states, are controlled by that part of the brain. And so what the implicit association test does, it actually tests your reaction to that. And if you're talking about making decisions, like whether if you're a police officer deciding whether to pull a trigger of a gun, or you're deciding uh, whether or not to let somebody out of jail, or what kind of sentence to give someone, uh, all of those things <coughs> are going to be affected by implicit biases. I, I, I hope Karen talks a little bit more. She recently went to a uh, training for judges. And now judges are supposed to be you know, right, the, the sort of highest level of decision making, trained not to be biased, and, and yet tremendous bias. I, I'll share a story that a judge told me. It was, he was a chief judge from another state. And he said, I'm, I'll tell you the story, I won't tell anybody, but I'll tell you. And uh, it, was, it was at a conference where they had the judges from all over the state there, and they passed out a file and to each judge. And the files were identical, the same police report, charge sheet, and, uh, and rap sheet. And so they asked the judges each to read the files and to do two things, to sentence the person and to set bail. And the only difference in the files is that half the files had a picture or a mugshot of a, a black person and half the files had a, a mugshot of a white person. And he said when they collected all the files back and the bail recommendation as well as the sentence, he said without exception, in every case, the bail for the, uh, for the uh, African American uh, individual uh, was 20 to 30 percent higher and the sentence was also 20 to 30 percent higher. Now that is in line with all of the, the research uh, that has been done to date uh, that shows that the criminal justice system is more punitive. And it's not surprising that that's also true. Uh, I see Pamela, how you doing? 
Uh, it's 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 also true uh, when uh, you're talking about decisions to uh, expel students or suspend students uh, from school, and that's something that is very uh, common has been proven. In San Francisco, we had something that was called willful defiance, uh, meaning that an individual could be suspended uh, from school simply for being defiant uh, in a classroom. And it just turned out that about 80% of the people who were being suspended for that were African American. And so the uh, school board actually put a policy in place where they are not allowing that. We, we've seen a huge drop in the amount of suspensions in my office, we have actually have a full-time attorney and support staff that uh, represents uh, young people in suspensions and expulsions to help address the disparities. But you know that link in terms of students being uh, kicked out of school uh, carries directly over into the criminal justice system because about 85 percent of the people in prison, our clients. Um, are individuals who have not completed a, a or do not have a high school education. So that's really something to think about when we're looking at, you know, what is the impact of implicit bias? It's simply not just a, you know, harmless opinion uh, that you might carry, uh, but it actually has very deep consequences in terms of uh, fairness in, in our society. When you start looking at um, education, employment, uh, obviously criminal justice, uh, you start seeing, you know, how it carries over uh, into uh, the outcomes that people experience uh, in this country. I'd like to just talk a briefly about pipeline issues and uh, as well as stereotype threat and, and how implicit bias impacts those two areas. So in terms of Let's just talk about the legal profession for a moment. Um, the legal profession, why is it important, first of all? Well, first of all, the President of the United States, the First Lady of the United States, the majority, the majority of the congressional representatives, the majority of the senators, they're all lawyers. So the judges the district attorneys, the public defenders. They're all lawyers. Why is it important to diversify and be more inclusive in the legal profession? Because we're looking at lawyers. Those are the decision makers. They're the policy makers. Unfortunately, the legal profession is not diverse. It's still over 80% white and 65% male. How does this play out? It plays out in the public defender's offices, not in our esteemed colleague here, uh, Jeff Adachi's office, which is quite inclusive and diverse. But throughout the United States, public defenders, those offices, are overwhelmingly white. That's certainly true in the district attorney's office. And the district attorney is the office that makes the prosecutorial discretionary decisions. If we're suspending and disciplining and expelling children in junior high school, instead of doing positive discipline and really encouraging education and higher education, instead of feeding the pipeline to prison, we need to be feeding the pipeline to college and to law school in order to make sure that the decision makers in our country include the population. What, is our, what does our population look like now? Because our population today is not over 80% white. That's not what's happening. That's not what's happening throughout the United States. And in California, 
it's we're already at 60% non-white in our population. We also are at 51% throughout the United States of female to male, right? So there are already more women than men. There are already more non-white people than white people, but yet the power base remains overwhelmingly male and white. Let's move from there, from talking about why it's important to have a pipeline that looks different than it does now, and to address these issues that both Jeff and Jock are talking about. When he talked about the brain and the amygdala, which when activated, we're afraid. It's our threat or fear part of our brain. So when the amygdala is activated, it's an immediate response. And if that response is to shoot or not to shoot, or run away from, or destroy, then we have, we have a serious problem in diversifying and including everyone. And the easiest thing to do is to accept or act on a stereotype because it's a very, it's simple. Oh, I have that information. It's a quick thing. So if you look at Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, uh, you'll see this. You'll also see when you take the IAT, which I highly recommend, and it's IAT at <coughs> harvard.edu. Um, when you go onto the website, you, with your computer, you have a wide variety of tests you can take on gender, race, color, phenotype, etc. Um, I recommend that you take several of them and just be honest with yourself because it's a self-evaluation, it's self-awareness. So finally, I wanted to talk about stereotype threat. We saw all of those images in Jeff's film. All of those images have created the amygdala response. The American brain is responding in this way and now it's in our DNA. How do we change that? The brain is plastic. So there's another part of our brain that addresses decision making. And that is not fully developed until age 25. Lots of studies have shown that uh, at Stanford now through MRI studies over the last 10 years of young people. So it doesn't, it's not fully developed until t age 25, which gets us into some sentencing issues as well as some other criminal justice and juvenile justice issues. The medial prefrontal cortex is the area of the brain that when activated, we see humanity. We make decisions. We are compassionate or we're not. And the medial prefrontal cortex is activated when we're near someone we respond to as another human being. One of the reasons we take care of babies is because our prefrontal cortex is activated and stimulated by them. We see them, we want to take care of them. We see that baby and we're in love with that baby. Even, even when it's not ours, we want to take care of it. Okay? This, these are primal responses in the brain. Princeton University conducted a series of studies on the medial prefrontal cortex by showing pictures of people and different kinds of faces in an MRI and to see when the medial prefrontal cortex was stimulated or activated. What they discovered 
was when they showed pictures of people to the participants in the MRI who appeared to be homeless, poor, black. This area of the brain was not activated. The people, the participants did not perceive these people as being people, as being humans. When they showed pictures of white people, fully dressed, dressed nicely, in a home environment, this area of the brain lit up. They were viewed as fully human. What does this mean to all of us? How can we change? First of all, we have to be fully aware of our responses and of our brain responses and that all of us are biased and that all of us have seen and been inundated with these images in Jeff's film all of our lives and our parents' lives and those before us. The second thing that we need to do is educate ourselves and others about all of the different cultures that make up America. We also need to educate ourselves about American history and I think that's why films like uh, Racial Facial make a difference because we must never forget and I'm glad we're here at Temple Emmanuel so that we can continue that mantra we will never forget we must remember it's important it's imperative that we remember American history and then finally what every single person in this room needs to do is intervene you need to become an interventionist intervene when you witness any bias because now you know oh you know a little bit about the brain the amygdala you know a little bit about the <laughs> medial prefrontal cortex you know about implicit bias you've done these these tests at Harvard you're able to share that information with people when they say something to you or to others that you know is biased so please Let's think about the positives as we look at all the negatives and we look at stereotypes and biases, but also let's look at how with our plastic brains we can make a change. Thank you very much. Round of applause. And while you're applauding, let's so applaud please. Um, Pamela Price, she is here with us. Uh, I appreciate her coming because it's in San Francisco when you get caught up in traffic and that sort of thing it's so easy to give up so let's give her a round of applause for for hanging in there and getting out and you'll see in the comments about her that in 2002 she made legal history in the Morgan versus Amtrak case by winning an appeal in the Ninth Circuit and also the US Supreme Court so a very accomplished attorney um, that knows a lot about this arena. Thank you, Thank you. Pamela. Thank you, yes. Hello, can you all hear me? Good, all right. First, I apologize for being late. I'm directionally challenged. And so, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally I go to the wrong place. So, um, I managed to get here, and yes, your traffic is horrible. Um, and I had to do a few quick changes coming from Juneteenth in Richmond all the way to San Francisco State and then back. Uh, but I'm here and I just want to take a few minutes to add something to the conversation. Um, Jackie had said it's true, I am a civil rights attorney. I've been blessed to be able to be a civil rights attorney for 33 years, to be in courtrooms where implicit and explicit bias is quite prevalent and is in fact the norm of the day from representing Mr. Morgan in a racial harassment case 
where he and other African-American men were being referred to as monkeys and niggers on the Amtrak yard in Oakland in the 1990s um, to just recently finishing my last trial in San Francisco where the judge would not look at me. He would not answer me, okay, in a federal courtroom where I am the lead lawyer and I still don't deserve the respect to even be spoken to or listened to. So I'm here to tell you, I met Jeff years ago and, and practiced in San Francisco Bayview Hunters Point doing criminal defense work. And I got out of that because I felt like the system was so rigged against people of color who I was representing every day. Um, I jumped into the civil justice system and after 30 years I can tell you it's not much better. The system is rigged. The whole thing is rigged and it's broken. And so what I would add to the conversation is that a lot of, yes, implicit bias ex exists and what they're saying is absolutely correct. We all make judgments. We are all on this journey where we have been taught uh, bias, we have been taught racism. I started off as a civil rights activist in the civil rights movement when I was 13 and got arrested in a demonstration and came out of an era where it was, we hated white. <laughs> I mean, fundamentally, it was hate white people. That's what I grew up with. And we've come a long way since then. Obviously, I had to go on a personal journey to get through that, which fortunately started when I was young. And ultimately, by the time I got to Yale College a few years later, I was able to say, um, everybody's a human being and I respect all life and I don't care what your sexual orientation is, what your race is, we all believe. Fundamentally we all believe, we all hurt um, and our perspective has to be one of respecting all life and um, human beings as is important. And so it is at this time in our history though one of the things I really appreciate about Jeff's film is that we often, as we go through the journey and we've come through our history, we forget our history. And that's what Karen said. We forget our history. We don't remember that um, the massacre in Orlando was not the worst massacre in American history. We want to forget that we've been massacring Native American people and African American people for generations. And that is an important piece of our history that we need to claim. And when you talk about needing a racial facial, we need a racial facial because we need to acknowledge that we did, that we came through that and that it does have implications now. I mean, the kind of ramifications of implicit bias is reflected not throughout our judicial system, throughout our um, entertain every industry, uh, whether it's our entertainment industry, whether it's our political realm, everywhere, people of color are not accepted, valued, um, or respected in so many ways. And so I, what I add to the conversation is to say, not only is it important and significant for each one of us to go on that personal journey to get to a place where we are empowered to speak out and to stand against racism and bias and homophobia. It is absolutely essential in this day and time that each one of us become change agents. That we hold the people who do represent us, who are primarily white and male, that we hold them accountable. And that we begin to engage in the political process and in other um, activities that are intended, designed, and ultimately have to change the face of America and what we look like and who is actually making decisions, whether it's in the tech industry or the entertainment industry, we can, our greatest enemy is complacency. And we have allowed, um, you know, people have become so complacent because they say, my vote doesn't matter, what I do doesn't matter. And that is why um, it's a refreshing, we're also refreshed by Black Lives Matter because these kids are saying it does matter. And I am going to put my energy into changing the way that people are being dealt with. So I celebrate Jeff for having taken the time to make the film and, and having given his life to a career that is so difficult um, and so painful in so many ways. And, and each of us 
as we have tried to excel in our different industries and in our different ways. But we need, when Obama got elected, he said, I can't do this by myself. And he can't. And our political leaders can't. And it's a time we have an opportunity now for people to hold our leaders accountable and for all of us to be engaged in the change. And that's where we are. Thank you. Wow, a lot of great information. Um, when I think about that film, Racial Facial, and all of the images, my head almost snapped back looking at those images because it was just almost too overwhelming, especially looking at the news accounts of uh, the various um, police shootings and things like that. Jeff, your film ends with this question, what can you do? And I know uh, Karen alluded to some things, and then we see also that uh, Jock with the Advocates for Justice, what, what he's doing. But with the amount of issues permeating our entire society that uh, even uh, Pamela brought back up, what can just the average person do to try to make changes about something that we're not consciously aware of, implicit bias? Any help for us? Well, I mean, I, I think we can, you know, each in our own unique way, <clears throat> make a difference. And that's kind of the exciting and fun thing about fighting uh, against injustice. You know, a lot of people assume, because I'm a public defender, they think, oh, God, you know, it must be terrible every day you wake up in the morning and you got to go, you know, fight a judge or fight a prosecutor or sometimes fight your own client. And actually, it's fun. It's, it's very reaffirming in terms of my life experience uh, to see uh, situations where if you don't intervene uh, there's going to be an outcome that isn't fair and being in the trial courts we have an opportunity to to affect that you know d directly um, so that's that's how I see contributing you know towards this and when I do see instances of racism uh, or discrimination I I don't always intervene. You know, I, I'd like to say that I would, but you don't always. You know, sometimes you don't have the energy. Sometimes you make a decision not to. Um, there are other times where it's probably best to, to let it go. Uh, but I'd say probably 80 or 90% of the time, I will say something um, because I expect that of myself. Um, you could run for office. Pam just was uh, elected to the... Uh, uh, Democratic uh, Central Committee and her community. That's huge. She was the she was the top vote uh, vote uh, getter, and you know, and, and it's just hard. It's hard to run for office. It's it's a very difficult thing, but that's a, a very important way that you can uh, represent. Uh, but it's more than just being trying to be a role model. I, I I think it does take figuring out how could I fit into this and. With Racial Facial, we made this film to spark discussions with students, uh, particularly. So we've showed the film to over a thousand students just in the last two months and received a very positive reaction. Uh, I made the film with two other uh, uh, filmmakers in their 20s, and I chose them because I wanted something that was going to be relevant you know, to young people. And so that's why we came up with you know, the song and uh, you know, the... the um, uh, images. We took over 450 images and, and, and put them in. The, they're almost too fast to keep up with. But if you go to our, our website, racialfacial.org, it breaks down all of the pictures and the stories uh, and, and the history of, of both the individuals and the movements that are captured there. And, and one thing that may not be obvious uh, from watching the film the first time is that throughout history you see uh, people of color uh, working together. Uh, with whites and with others. Uh, if you look at the Civil War pictures, right, there were, there were, you know, black soldiers and white soldiers side by side. Now, they were not allowed to fight in the same uh, regiments. They were separated, right, segregated, but uh, they, they were on the same side. If you look at the Freedom Riders, right, the, these were uh, white and black students who, and Asian students, Native Americans, and Latinos who decided that they were going to challenge the public transportation uh, system. The, the laws that 
that Pam and her practice now enforce weren't around then. And so they helped create that, that change. So it really, I think, is an exciting time because we now have an opportunity to participate in the remaking of the criminal justice system. Jacques Wilson is one of the heads of the Racial Justice Committee in our office, and they've done a tremendous amount of work, uh, both in working with the public. We have a court watch program where you can come and watch court and see for yourself uh, what happens in the courtrooms. And uh, also, uh, they have done a tremendous amount of advocacy in terms of improving you know, police practices and use of force, all these debates that are going on right now. So I actually see it as very exciting and, uh, you, know, it, you know, reinvigorating. And it really gives all of us an opportunity uh, to, to make a difference every day. I mean, that's what sort of, I think, maybe distinguishes animals from, from humans. I mean, you know, I guess you can be an animal, you know, you could be an animal and be an activist, but... Um, you know, <laughs> humans have the ability, you know, to take positions on things, to, you know, to, to try and create positive social change and, and, and to talk about it. And so, you know, we, we, we need to have more of that. Well, one of the things that um, Karen Judge Klopman said was about changing the pipeline uh, because of looking at the demographics uh, of the people that are the power base and with them being, uh, there being a disparity, how do you th uh, see that changing, Jock? Do you mind speaking to that? Because you're working to, with some of the young people uh, with your advocates for, for justice. Do you see that there's going to be a change in that dynamic, in that pipeline? Yes, I do, and I think that part of the change is already going on and part of the reason is because of panels and discussions like this. I mean, it's uh, Jacku Wilson who's out there who Jeff said uh, he works at the public defenders. When our school system fails, the students, they end up being at the public defender's office, you know, disproportionately. And uh, part of the problem, uh, now that I've been doing this for about three or four years, I think the greatest impact is the implicit bias. The, if a lot of teachers and a lot of administrators think they're acting in good faith. Okay, but they don't realize the unconscious bias that is affecting their decision making uh, in, uh, in, in a great way. And I think that, uh, you know, part of that is, is that, you know, here's the good news. I think that uh, there's truth in numbers, but I also believe in the power of one and that each of us has the power to change the world. Uh, and what we have to do is realize is that life comes down to a series of choices. And we have to ask ourselves, are we going to continue to be blind to the injustice or suffering of others? Or we want to be a part of the change that we want to create? Okay, and part of what we do with Advocates for Justice is about the solution. And I love working with Mr. Adachi because he does the thing like Court Watch. And when we bring these kids, black kids, white kids, Latino kids, and they sit down and they watch Racial Facial and they start the discussion, you could see the light bulb turning on, okay? And then they get to see, you know, Latino judges, African American judges. But a lot of these people who come from these smaller areas have never seen a positive black person or a positive person of color. And so when they see them and they say, look, you know what, this person's like my dad, this person's like my brother, it starts to change and the dynamics change. And so I think that the most important thing is trying to reach these children at an early age so we could stop the school to prison pipeline. Uh, and I think once we stop that school to prison pipeline, we will end mass incarceration uh, because people become awakened to these injustices in the video. I mean, what, I'm sorry for going on and on, but I love the video because you know, when you sit there as a person of color, and a lot of times as black people, we think that we're the only ones who have been discriminated against. We feel that way. But when you look and you see the Chinese Americans, the Japanese Americans, the Latinos, and even the comments that Donald Trump made about Latinos, and you say, look, you know what? Today is them, but tomorrow can be me again. You know, and I think that we all have to realize that, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it best when he said an injustice to one is an injustice to all. And my favorite psychologist was a lady named Jane Elliott, and she said the only thing necessary for the perpetuation of evil is for good people to do nothing. And I think when more good people start getting up and they come to discussions like this and they're part of panels like this, that we're going to start being the change that we hope to create. I've got several other questions, but I don't want to hog the mic. So if there's anyone that would like to um, ask a question, please come forward. 
Ms. Richards? Yes, ma'am. Uh, before my questions, I just, um, if I may, uh, make some comments. And I want to start with Ms. Jackie Wright for continuing the legacy of the Black Film Festival. And I know you work very tirelessly in the community. I live in the Baby Hunters Point, a long time, you know, resident. My name is Linda Fadike Richardson, an immigrant. And I also know Ms. Karen Galton. And for the first time, I'm Mr. Jack Wilson. I have decades of actually one of the fans of Mr. Jeff Adashi. And I know about your work, um, Ms. Pamela Wrights. I think the commonalities here, you ask, what could be done? What should we do? The fact that we are here in an afternoon on Saturday at the Congregation Emmanuel in a Jewish uh, community. We have Mr. Jeff Adashi, a Japanese American, and then we have African Americans. Um, there is hope somewhere. There is hope because the, the commonalities of all of you are, you are, have identified that the judicial system in America has implicit bias. And all of you are attorneys. You have uh, legal background. I heard uh, McLaughlin talking about the pipeline, which is basically where all the efforts need to be now in order for us to be able to mitigate and make the corrections. And I also hear uh, Mr. Wilson saying that, yes, we can all complain about the problems, but you need to initiate solutions. And so you and your brother, and I look at your film, very impressive. Here you have all these kids now, broadening their horizon, taking them to places, Warriors game, and places to really boost their self-esteem. And then you have, you know, Miss Pamela Price, all the decades and successful and landmark cases. So I've always felt that the judicial system, we need to identify the institutions in America and we need to look at the media. And we need to look at Hollywood. And I hope that all of you here, and even those in the audience and some here, that we need to attack. It, at this time right now, we need a concerted efforts to attack all these institutions because on an individual level, in here, we're all common people and we all want things. But unless we focus on the institution, you're already doing your part on the judicial system. I think there needs to be a concerted effort to really now expose. So your documentaries should not only be shown on the Black Film Festival. I think we need a meeting of the minds that we can have Ms. Jackie Wright and the people that are already in communications and film be able to show this all year round continuously. And that's the solution. So that's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more question. Uh, Jenna Snow. Well, I have so many thoughts. I have so many thoughts. I have so many comments. I know. I, I realize that. Uh, first of all, I, I'm just so impressed with all of you. I really am. And I'm going to cry. This is so emotional. Racial facial. My heart was beating so fast with all those images. Things that we we're born in a certain time and we don't really know what happened before, but that really brought it to light. And also the fact that you showed the different ethnic groups that have been, you know, massacred over the years or unfairly treated. And it's just, it was just very emotional for me. I, I want to make a real quick comment here about the speed of it. You're right, it was a little too fast for us old folks. <laughs> for the young folks, that's how they live. They live at that speed which is really interesting because for them that was probably just right. But it was, it was just so, so very impactful to me. I have a couple of just uh, other comments. When I grew up in a very white bread, I call it white bread. Uh, uh, went to high school, a very white bread high school. We had one black person in the grade below me. We had one Asian in the grade above me. But was unusual is that they both were class presidents, which was very unusual at the time. And then my grade, we had a woman as the president of our class. So I, I, we were kind of like the mod squad in a way, but 
um, you know, I, I feel that we were in a very progressive school, despite the fact that it was 2,000 basically white kids. I know, it, it, time goes real fast. A couple quick questions, though. Um, how long did it take you to make that film, and where did you get all those images? And I'll end with that. Yeah, well, well thank you. Thank you for sharing that story, too. And really, I think that the power of a film uh, is that it really the reaction that it evokes, and that's really what we're after. Not, it wasn't so much just the film, but it was about the reaction. Um, but uh, most of the images we got from, you know, just from uh, the, the uh, Internet. And, you know, because it's a uh, sort of a, a satir, uh, satire historical film, you know, you're able to use uh, under the fair use doctrine. Um, but, you know, we, we what we tried to do is to pull together, you know, images that would sort of objectively uh, tell a story and, you know, without judgment. And so when people watch it, you know, they can sort of look at it and come to their own conclusions as to, you know, what it means. Um, just to end on, on, on a positive note, I think as, as people have already said, the answer to implicit bias uh, is to become aware of it. And there's a second half to the study about the judges, is that they were able to uh, correct many of the injustices once the judges became aware of it. And we're told that there was a monitor uh, in the room keeping track. And that's where you saw the self-correction factor. So we still have a long way to go, obviously with the hate crimes in Orlando and everything else that's happening in our society. We, we have a long way to go, uh, but we have to start somewhere. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause for our panel. We're ov obviously going to have to um, put this show on the road. We're going to have to do this again someplace else. I would like to thank uh, Congregation Emmanuel for opening their doors of the temple for us to have this conversation. I'd like to thank uh, Johnny Burrell for uh, taping this so that uh, there will be additional eyes that will be looking at this. And, um, you know, I think it was said earlier um, by both, um, both Jeff and Karen, the fact that it, it goes beyond the legal system. It has to go, it, it, it deals with all aspects of our life, education, employment. Uh, as a matter of fact, my daughter, who is a recruiter for a major corporation, uh, basically told me, as I was telling her about some of the problems of my getting a job, well, Mom, nobody wants to hire their mother. So, you know, you have implicit bias that's affecting us in so many different ways. And I really uh, appreciate this and look forward to having the San Francisco Black Film Festival having a redux um, and um, showing this film again and having this conversation because an hour and a half was unrealistic in the first place. But we just did want to uh, let everyone know that this is something that the film festival is very concerned about. It speaks to its history. And it's something that our community needs to take hold of in light of what's happening in our institutions like the San Francisco Police Department. So I thank you all for being here. We have um, just a token of appreciation for your um, being a part of it. It's, this is the festival pass. And uh, we look forward to having you guys not only come to this festival and, and judge Klump, and I'll give, give you yours, but I want to make an extension that this is not only for this year, but for perpetual years forward, you will have a pass to the San Francisco Black Film Festival. And thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>